Well, good morning, everyone. I want to welcome you to Crossroads, invite you to take out your teaching outlines that are found right there in your program. And before any of you start wondering, um, I'm not going through another life change as a young man to a grown-up. I just had a little cold this week, so bear with me, okay? But I want to invite you to take out your teaching outlines as we're continuing this message series on the prayer puzzle. And we've been looking at the different pieces that help us put together an accurate picture of exactly what prayer is. Because when it comes to our relationship with God, prayer is not an addendum. It's not an add-on or a tack-on. It's not a program, but it is the very lifeblood of the believer. You and I need to have a vibrant communication with God. We need to have this vertical relationship with Him so we can deal with the horizontal that goes on in our life not just through difficult times or in the valley, but no matter what experiences that God might bring us. But most importantly, no matter how young or old you are in the Lord, God desires that you would have a healthy and vibrant relationship with Him. And obviously, the Scriptures is part of that and the anchor of that objective. But don't forget prayer. And so these different pieces help give you and I In our human fatality, in our human mindset, the ability to see what God's will is for prayer. Because obviously there's been hundreds and hundreds of publications, resources, and books that have been said and given on prayer. But when it comes down to it, we need to see, well, what does God's Word teach about this important area? And so this morning I'd like to share with you another piece, I believe a very important piece as well, and that is the assurance piece. See, when it comes to prayer, and it comes to, when it comes to approaching God, when it comes to asking God for, whether it be our needs or desires, as they line up with His will, God doesn't want us coming to Him with a doubting spirit. He doesn't want us to have, as the saying goes, one foot in and one foot out. He wants us to be fully relying on Him with a confidence that He knows what we are asking for before we even ask Him. He wants us to operate with this assurance because it's this assurance that helps you and I persevere through some of life's most difficult of circumstances. But that assurance is not based on our good looks. It's not based on our religious merits. It's not based on a track record that we can hold up to God and say, God, look at my religious record, and that somehow gives us an assurance. That actually might make you more discouraged. The assurance comes from Christ. Take notice of what it says in Hebrews 10.22. It's one of our memory verses. Why don't we say it aloud together? Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed. Very good. I'm going to need you on these verses to say them while I grab a drink, okay? That'll, that'll, be, our, that'll be our deal today. Our hearts have been sprinkled clean. There can be no forgiveness of sins without the shedding of blood, the blood of Christ. So our assurance to come into the presence of God is not based on how charismatic we might be with our expression of faith or how reserved we might be. It has nothing to do with preferences. It has nothing to do with our idiosyncrasies. It has everything to do with the atoning work of Jesus Christ on the cross. See, the atoning work of Christ produces an assurance that is greater than any confusion, any frustration, and yes, any difficulties we might endure in this life. So that when we come to God in prayer, as we are praying in His will, based on what Christ has done, we can have confidence when we pray. But not human confidence, a spiritual confidence in Almighty God. 1 John 5.14, why don't we say it together? Listen, this is the Word of God. Some of you are going... To the, I was going to say the Met game, but nobody's really going to see them these days, I guess. But the Yankee game, maybe. But we're yelling out for players who make $20 million a year. They don't even know your name. Okay? Let's say this verse with conviction like we believe it, please. Okay? 1 John 5.14. Together. 
This is, go. Okay, you know, God wants you to understand that he's listening with both ears. And he wants you to be listening to his word with both ears. He wants you to have an assurance that surpasses your difficulties. And that surpasses something else that is a reality of life. See, in this life, you and I will have storms. Now, some of us, we create our own storms. We're good at that. We just can't have a peaceful day. we got to go find trouble. We say trouble finds us. No, we find trouble. And so what happens here at this point is we create our own chaos, our own difficulties, but God wants us to know that he's still with us in those storms. And so there are storms of bad choices, but there are also storms of bad circumstances. And these circumstances come. Maybe somebody failed you. Somebody let you down. Somebody disappointed you. Somebody hurt you. Whatever it might be, medical, financial, relational, these are all facts of life. Now, those who might have both feet on the shore, it's our job to remind people to have an assurance in the storm. Nevertheless, the storms of life are a part of life. Now, all of us know uh, far too well and too familiar just almost six years ago when the last hurricane came here to Staten Island. And all around, you saw chaos and these, these crazy winds, these ferocious winds. But one thing is true about a hurricane and most storms is that the most peaceful and calm place in a storm is in the eye of the storm. It's the chaos that's happening all around. What this means is is that it's possible in the midst of a crazy storm with incredible rogue winds and raging waves to find peace in the storm. Spiritually, the same is true. That when you and I go through the storms of life, however they may come and however fierce they may be, we can find peace and calmness in Christ. Now, to illustrate that further, turn with me to Luke's gospel once again. Luke chapter 8, verses 22 to 25, records one of several occurrences of Jesus, a storm, a boat, and the disciples. And I believe that God has purposely left these accounts in the Scriptures, in the Gospels, to give you and I obviously application, obviously a point of reference, but most importantly, hope. Hope that there is indeed calmness and confidence to be had through the storms of life. That when you think about assurance, Assurance isn't the prosperity movement that it's all going to go my way, because that's just not true. Assurance is that the storms will come, but Christ is with me in the storms. That is true Christian maturity. Now, we can wish the storm away, but it doesn't work that way. But we could trust Christ through the storm. And so, starting in Luke 20, chapter 8, verse 22... It says this in God's record here, the Word of God. It says, one day, he and his disciples got into a boat. Now, most likely, this is either Peter, Andrew, James, or John's boat. They are fishermen by trait. God has obviously, Christ has called them to follow him. They're now fishers of men. But they haven't relinquished their business because they weren't just helpers in the fishing business. They had a thriving business. Some of you who have owned businesses or own businesses now, this was a business with loads of employees and clientele. They had boats along the sea. They had people working for them. So they weren't schleps that just decided, I had nothing else going for me, so I might as well follow Jesus. They left the success of riches to follow Jesus. They still have some of the boats in their possession And they're using the boats for ministry, which is also an illustration of whatever God gives you is for his use. Nevertheless, they got into one of the boats, one of these fishing vessels, and it says that this, (coughs) Jesus told them, let's cross over. Now, underline this entire part here. Let's cross over to the other side. Now, notice it doesn't say, let's cross under to the other side. 
That wouldn't be too encouraging. Let us cross over to the other side. Keep that in mind and note the record there. It says, so they set out, so they go out. Now, the Sea of Galilee, to give you an understanding if you've never been there, has similar measurements to this island, this Staten Island here. It's 13 miles wide, the Sea of Galilee. Now, Staten Island is 13 miles long, but the number is the same, 13, but just like Staten Island, the number seven is also in there. The Sea of Galilee is seven long, so it's a little bit different. So Staten Island is the opposite, 13 and seven. Nevertheless, think of the Sea of Galilee as this way. Also, it, it sat in a low-level low setting 680 feet below sea level, which means when a storm would come, it would have extra wind pressure that would come in, and the storms could be pretty violent. Nevertheless, they set out onto the water. And it says, verse 23, as they were sailing, Jesus fell asleep. Now, there's nothing wrong with that, nothing wrong with taking a rest. He's fully God, but he's fully human. The guy's tired. There's nothing wrong with it. He's taking a nap. He's asleep. Now, as he's asleep, it says, then a fierce windstorm came down. Now, Luke is not only a physician, he is an educated historian. How he words this, not only in the English as we read it today, some 2,000 years later, but as you study in the Greek language, it's perfectly laid out. It says the fierce storm this windstorm, this fierce storm means that it was like nothing ever before that these disciples, who by the way, have been on the water hundreds of times, it gives you the idea that they've never seen a storm like this. And it says that a fierce windstorm, that it came down. Not only is Luke a doctor and historian, now he could be a meteorologist because he is properly describing exactly how this storm took place. It came through the wind tunnel, it came down, and it came on the lake, the Sea of Galilee, which is where they are. Now, Luke tells us that they began to be swamped. In other words, that means that the water started coming over the boat. The other two gospel writers, Matthew and Mark, who also give us the details of this, say that the water was literally breaking against the boat. Now here, Luke's gospel tells us that the water was creeping into the boat. Now, we know that Mark, was heavily influenced by the Apostle Peter. And so Mark gives us certain details because Peter was literally on the boat. Luke gives us these details because he interviewed the men who were on this boat. And so these eyewitness accounts, these detailed reports that have been preserved for us are laid out here, and it says that they began to be swamped. Now, one historian says that the waves were normally on a regular storm were 10 feet. You could arguably say that this was doubled at 20 feet. And so all of this is going on. Now, they are going to get very afraid, but Jesus is asleep. And you might be thinking, how in the world could Jesus be asleep? Does he own one of those, you know, that, that Mr. Pillow guy, my pillow guy? Does he have one of those right now? How is he this comfortable? You know, is, does he got one of those big warm blankets on and he's all... How is he this? How is he that asleep? Jesus knew this storm was coming. And he is not going to be caught off God by it. But he's already given his word to them. Let's cross over to what? The other side. He's already spoken that word to them. And what they're going to learn, because later on at the end of the story, they're going to be told, you know, what's going on with your faith, basically? Why? Because he already told them. We're going to get over to the other side. And His Word never fails. His Word will never come back void. He told them, let's cross over to the other side. Plus, He's in the boat. They should have perfect trust in what He has said and the fact that He is there. But just like you and I, they're all caught off guard here. They're all disheveled. Now, what can we learn from this? Something very simple, but yet very profound. Write this first principle down. Rely on the Scriptures for confidence. This is Scripture that when Jesus opening His mouth is Scripture in their time. By Jesus saying, let's cross over to the other side, that's the equivalency of you and I taking a promise from Psalms, from Proverbs, from the Gospels, from the Epistles, from the Prophets, from the historical books of the Bible, 
from the Pentateuch, any place you want to go in all 66 books of the Bible, all 30,000 plus versions, anywhere you want to go, that's the equivalency of such that you and I are finding legitimate confidence in something God has already said. And that's the confidence that you want to have. Because God has a 1,000% batting average with His Word. Now, He's a home run hitter. And usually, home run hitters usually strike out a lot. Not God. He hits it out of the park with His promises, but He's got a great eye. God never strikes out when it comes to His Word. Joshua 21.45, listen to what this says. Not one word of all the good promises that the Lord had made to the house of Israel, finish the rest of it with me, had failed. All came to pass. All. Now as I told you in Greek, all means all. In Hebrew, all means all. All of His promises have come to pass. See, sometimes we get in a habit of focusing more on our opinions. That happens in Bible studies sometimes and in groups. Well, this is what I think, and this, that, and we, we bring in other things. We have about 5% Scripture and about 95% of opinion. And that's what we usually base our confidence on. Well, I think, well, wait a minute. We need to step back. What does God say? What does His Word say? Not how I think I'm going to get through something. Oh, I feel it. Oh, I got good instincts. Throw all that out. When you're in a storm, you need the promises of God. You need His rock-solid Word. You need His truths because He's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore, and so is His Word. Now, some people think, oh, you know what? The Bible, that's been written for a bunch of rules, right? You know, God's such a killjoy. No. The Scripture scriptures have been preserved so that men, women, and children can know that there is no other name to call on for salvation but the name of Jesus Christ. That we can have a hope beyond this world. But not only that, that we can have a hope while we're in this world in Christ. Romans 15, 4. Why don't we say this verse together? Uh, you know, this isn't one of your memory verses, but I encourage you to commit it to memory. Say it together. For everything... That was written in the past. Keep going. Might have hope. That God wants you to have an encouragement that will provide a hope for you. But we have to be willing to take it. Now I know that as you see people in your own life, you may not have a storm, but you might know people that do. They need the promises of God as belligerent as they may be to you, you still want to share it. I heard the story of a gentleman from the General Bible Society, the president. His name was Gaylord Camereni. And Camereni gave a Bible to what was a mean-spirited man who insulted him and wanted to give the Bible back to him. But he made a little promise and a little bet with him because the man said to him, if you give me this Bible... I'll read the Gospels, but I'm gonna, every page I read, I'm going to rip it out. And I'm going to smoke it. I'm going to make a cigarette out of it. And so the president says, wow. He said, I'll tell you what. Do you promise that you'll read each page as you smoke? He said, yes, I will. Fifteen years later, the two men met at a Bible conference in Zimbabwe. The man now a minister for the last dozen years. And he said to him, I smoked Matthew. <laughs> smoked Mark. You get the picture. By the time I got to John chapter 3, verse 16, I gave my life to Christ. See, why do I share that with you? The Bible's more than just pages. It's more than just something that should just sit in the house on display open to Psalm 23 or something like that. It's more than something we just read at a wedding, you know, two token passages. You know, as I counsel and prepare couples for their nuptials and their special day, it's not just a throw-in. Okay, get your 1 Corinthians 13 in. Love is this, love is that. Wait a minute. 
This is the word of God. This is what you want to base your home on. This is what you want to base your life on. Thank God for the flower girl and the ring boy. But God needs to be the center of not just a ceremony at a wedding. He needs to be the, cent the center of my life and your life. His word is the substance of who we are. And he said, let's cross over to the other side. As you flip your notes over, write this second principle down. Refocus on calmness rather than change. Refocus on calmness rather than change. Now, why do we say that? Because what do you and I do when we're in a storm? We start thinking of all the ways that this shouldn't be and couldn't be. We start blaming other people. Oh, if they would have did this, if they would have did that. Man, people get crazy with that stuff, right? And we want to change the situation by trying to pin blame on somebody. We then even blame God. That's what they're going to do here. They don't want to wake them up because they know the rest of the chapter we do. They want to wake them up to complain to them. You're sleeping, we're about to die here for crying out loud. That's what they want to do. That's what we would have did if we were on that boat. But sometimes when we're in a storm, the change we say is, oh, I regret doing this and I should have did that. And we start blaming ourselves. And we start digging our own grave, basically, because we're focused on trying to change the circumstances. What we really need to focus on in the storm is calmness, the calmness that Christ brings. Returning back here to Luke, now look at the next two verses. First verse 24, it says, they came and woke him up, saying, Master, Master, we're going to die. The other Gospels gives us the understanding by way of Peter, hey, do you care that we're going to die? Now, some critics of the Gospels try to say, well, wait, in Matthew, he's saying, Lord. In Mark, they're saying, Teacher. And here in Luke's Gospel, they're saying, Master. Well, of course. There's not just one person on the boat. You're going to call him what you know him to be. You know, maybe Peter's saying, teacher, because he's learned a few things that that hard head had never learned before. Maybe Andrew's calling him Lord because he's been touched by the miracles that he's done. And maybe Luke's account of Master is coming by way of John, who is at the foot of the cross and heard him say, it is finished. Maybe it was John who heard that word of Christ from the cross reverberate all throughout the earth. And so to John, he's master. When you get to heaven, you can ask them why. But I'm going to tell you why. Because this is not a made-up record. These are human beings experiencing a storm. And God... Is Savior and Lord for all of us. I understand that. But He might be peace for you. He might be comfort for you. He might be mercy for you. He might be deliverer for you. He might be the El Shaddai. He might be Jehovah Jireh who provides. You get the picture. As you get to know God and His Word, they were walking with Him. They're not perfect. They're forgetting. They're mistrusting. They're doubting. But He's Master to them. He's Lord to them. He is the master teacher with the words of life. In John 6, 66, by the way, I don't think that's a coincidence. It says that some deserted him and stopped following Christ. The evil number, John 6, 66, because it's an evil thing to leave the side of Jesus. And then Jesus said, well, who else are you guys going to? He says to his disciples, you're going to leave me too? You know, good old Peter, right? Lord, where else are we going to go? You got the words of life. In a storm, you don't need human psychology. You don't need a pep talk. You don't need an opinion. You need the word of God. 
The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the Word of God stands forever. That is what we need. We need God's Word. God's Word is trustworthy because God's Word is going to bring calmness. Master, Master, we're going to die. Then he got up. Now this is amazing. And he rebuked the wind and the raging waves. This incredible storm. This fierce storm. It says, so they ceased, plural they, because it was the wind had aggravated the body of water and it caused their lives literally to be in jeopardy. So, now this says, so they ceased. Now that word cease in the Greek language means to be quiet. You ever have noise in your home, whether you have kids or not, and there's a lot of noise and you're trying, and you, that's it, quiet! Nobody ever listens, but... You say it anyway. Jesus calmed the water just like that. It was loud. It was threatening. They lost their way. And with one word, he calmed it down. Quiet, that's what he said. And he brought total calmness. It says, so they ceased, and there was a what? A what? A calm. Uh, you got to speak louder. My ears are a little clogged too. I told you I'm sick. Okay. There was a what? Wow. A calm. We got, it, it wasn't a change. He didn't transport them out of the lake, although he could do that. But that's not real because they're not going to be able to do that after he dies, resurrects, and ascends to God the Father in heaven. I know. I, I've tried. You can't snap your fingers and you're out of your circumstance. It's much like when he was in the wilderness and when he was tempted. He could have easily smoked the devil. He could have called on legions of angels to come down. He could have destroyed the devil right there, but he didn't do it. Every time the devil opened his mouth, you remember that scene, right? What did Jesus do? He threw scripture in his mouth, right back at him. Every time the devil tempted him with a lie, turn these stones to bread, it would have smelled like the best bakery on Staten Island. He could have easily did it. But he didn't do it. Why? Because you and I can't turn stones to bread. I wish I could turn stones to cannolis. That'd be great. Or those seven layer cookies, okay? It's probably a good thing I can't. <laughs> Nevertheless, Jesus didn't do it because we can't do it. He quoted scripture back. Because that's what brings the calmness. He could have, he could have taken them out of this scene, but he didn't do it because he knows that this is going to be the first of millions of storms that his children are going to go through after this. And we need to know how to navigate these waters. And the way to do it is to focus on calmness. That's the way to do it. See, Jesus was in the storm, but Jesus didn't let the storm get in him. When you and I are in the storm, we can't let the storm get in us. we got to remember who's already in us. That's Jesus Christ. And the same power that rose Christ from the dead is alive and well in us. You know, I heard this story, I read this story about a painting contest that was being held. And the objective was the winner who could paint the most peaceful scene would win first prize. And so there were some incredible entries. One of them was this beautiful Sunset, picturesque scene. There was another one of an amazing beach with the plush, beautiful, clean sand. We don't know about that here on Staten Island, but it's a picture someplace else. The beautiful water, the sun glistening. Then there was a wintry scene with beautiful, fresh fallen snow. What a house in the background where you can look in the window and see the fireplace lit. But none of those paintings won. There was another painting, though, of an incredible storm with a bolt of lightning touching down. But off to the right was this mountain, and in the cleft was a nest with a mother bird and looking closely under that wing was six of her babies. And that painting won first prize. 
Because that was the perfect picture of peace. Because life is not one sunset after another. Life is not beautiful, fresh, fallen snow. Because you've got to shovel it, right? Okay. Life is not one trip to the beach after another. You've got to go to work. But life is one storm after another. And the Psalms say that underneath His wings is where we are. That that is a picture of peace. Let's focus not on, let me just change my location. I have found out through years of counseling people that a funny thing happens. You can move, but your problems get in the suitcase. And you unpack them when you get there. How about vacation? If I could only just go, listen, I, like, I wish I could vacation every other week. That'd be great. I, I love vacation. But here's the thing. you got to come home. And sometimes it's more stressful preparing for a trip and then getting back from a trip anyway. So vacation, as great as it is, sometimes can be overrated. It's not the end all. It's nice, but that's not the magic pill. What we must realize is, is that we want to focus on calmness, not just a change in geography or a change in income, or a change in status, or a change in relationship, we need to focus on the calmness that God wants to bring. That God can only bring. See, we must remember, peace is not the absence of trouble in the storm. Peace is knowing that God is right with you in the storm. Big difference. Gives us a peace that surpasses all human understanding. Philippians 4, 6 and 7. There are so many well known verses here. They could all be memory verses. I had to whittle it down, but commit this one to memory if you haven't already. Why don't we say this verse together? Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Underline that phrase, that part of the verse, which transcends all understanding. It gives the idea that it far surpasses it. It's almost like if I ran against an Olympic athlete, an Olympic runner, he would blow me away. I know that might be hard for somebody to think I look like an incredible athlete. I understand that, okay? (laughs) What are you laughing for so hard, okay? Humor me a little bit. Anyway. Speaking of running, um, next month, right here in our own neighborhood, we're going to be honoring Sergeant Ullis, who gave the ultimate sacrifice and died in combat. And they're having another 5K run in honor of him. And if you would like to participate, we want to participate as a church. If you, have, if you would like to be a part of that, after service, you could see Perry in the back. If you could just put your hand up, Perry, right there in the back. You could see him, and we want to tell you more about that and how you can get involved. And Perry will be here tonight actually sharing about it, and next week he'll share more about the race as more details unfold. Even, you could just even walk in it. The whole point is, is that you're participating in the race in honor of somebody who made a great sacrifice. Last year I was in the race and I was tempted because you run along the train tracks. The train was coming at Jefferson. I was going to hop in the train and take it back to New Dorp, but I didn't think that would be a good witness, so I didn't do it. But you run right in this neighborhood and come back. It's a great witness. And wouldn't it be great for all of us to participate? Walk or run, however you want to do it, or if you're in a wheelchair, because... It's about being in the race. And I think the same thing is true spiritually. We're told to run the race with endurance, which means that there's going to be times that we want to give up. There's going to be times when we're spent. But remember this, that he gives a peace that surpasses all of that, all of those difficulties. We've got to refocus on calmness. Write this last principle down before we close. Remove my roots of self-reliance. Remove my roots of self-reliance. As you jot that down, as we close up this passage now, where is this taking place on the Sea of Galilee? 
These men are what by profession? Fishermen. Right. So if they're fishermen and they're on the Sea of Galilee, they've been on the sea many other times. They have a fishing business for crying out loud. God was preparing them for future storms, and to do it, He took them to the spot where they relied on themselves the most. He didn't take them anywhere else. He didn't take them to the forest. He didn't take them to a hill somewhere. He took them to the place where they naturally were conditioned to trust in themselves the most. Because He was teaching them to abandon that self-trust and to put their trust in Him, because that's the key with overcoming storms. And He literally took them to what they thought would have been their comfort zone, and He made it extremely uncomfortable. And He said to them, where is your faith? Did I not tell you we're going to cross over to the other side? Where's your faith? I told you we're going to get over there. And God says to you and I, if you're struggling today in your storm, I will never leave you nor forsake you. He has told you that He is our eternal God and underneath are His everlasting arms. He has told us to call upon Him, to cast our cares, to cast our fears over to Him. But we got to remove these roots. we got to remove them and give them over to Him. It says they were fearful, and they were amazed. Wouldn't you be? They were probably there standing soaking wet, and all of a sudden the rain, the wind, and the waves have been brought still. And they're just looking at him like, what? This is amazing. He calmed the storm completely. I would imagine that the sun came out, because God does things great. Not only did he calm it, the sun came out. Well, the sun was already out. He was on the boat. But the other sun came out, and it was shining down. But we have these roots, these roots of self-denial. Now, I didn't plan this originally, but I thought, why? I can't pass this up. It just fits in so perfectly. Um, As you know, I'm not the best guy around the house. I recently changed the doorknob, and my family threw a party. It was amazing, okay? (laughs) So I don't have those sets of skills. I thank God for people that do. But... I tackled a project yesterday where we, had, we used to have a tree in front of the house and the city take, took it down and finally took out the stump and the roots always obstructed the growth of the grass, even the sidewalk. And so I decided to take up all the grass to put new topsoil and seed and then the sod. I didn't know what I was getting into. So I kept finding root after root And I kept digging so many times, I said, I'm just going to throw the sod on top of all this and be done with it. My neighbors must have thought I was crazy because they could hear me grunting and not, you know, not complaining, but uh, pulling this out and and I'm burning up all over my body because the sun's out for a little bit and I'm sweating, I'm getting all this stuff, I got dirt all over me and I don't like dirt on me. See, a lot of times people say, hey, why don't you go camping, Ray? My idea of the outdoors is checking into a high rise and going down to the beach and then going back to the room. That's my idea of the outdoors, being an outdoorsman. So I don't like the whole idea of getting dirt. But I'll tell you what, I felt kind of cool. I had all the dirt around me. But I had to bring this root that I got. This actually, this was part of a 20-foot root. I cut it off, okay? This isn't a decoration here, okay? Check this thing out here, okay? So, so this thing right here, this root, I, I was about to throw, I was almost done, and I found this root, and it was just bubbling up, and I said, I got to get this. And so I got the chainsaw out and started to cut the root in pieces. That's the only way I was going to get it up. But finally, I was able to get this root up, and i tell you what, it, it felt really good. And I let out like a loud yell as I pulled it up. I felt like a real man for once in my life, but, <laughs> but, but I, pulled, I pulled this thing out, and you know... Boy, you know, it's great having sons because they always look up to you. Oh, daddy's so strong, you know. But I thought about that route and I said, wow, that's, there were so many lessons that God was teaching me while I was doing this. And one of them also was to rely on him because in my own strength, I wanted to give up. 
And a couple times I was like, Lord, I need to finish this because I don't want to show my boys that you start something and you don't finish. And so God, give me the strength. I want to quit. And so I had a little intermission. I, I, we did, I was going at it for about six hours. And then Joseph had, I had to get Joseph ready for his football game. So I worked him out for a little bit. And then we got to the game and we were on the sideline. And, you know, as one of the coaches, you talk to all the kids. But I pulled Joseph aside and I just felt led to pray over him. We usually pray in the car, but I just pray for God's hand to be upon him. He had a great warm up and a great practice. And by the way, he had helped me all morning with this outside. So he was tired and I felt like, oh Lord. And I, really it was a guilt prayer. Lord, I pray that I didn't tire him out too much, you know, because this is a playoff game and we really need him. Well, he went out and he had a great game. He had three touchdowns and it was, it was amazing. And when we got home, I had to finish it. I had about four more feet to go. And we finally got it. It was done. And I thought about these roots, and I was thinking, Lord, how many roots in my life need to come up? How many dead roots are just sitting there that are just, just need to be plucked out so what you want to plant can flourish and grow the way that it should but I got to be diligent, Lord. I, I understand your grace, but you also call me to put a little grit in. I got to roll my sleeves up. It's amazing how we do everything else we want to do. We'll get to work. We'll get to a play. We'll get to a ball game. We'll go work out. We'll go take this class. We'll do everything we want to do. But when it comes to God in church, you know, I, I, I got this, I got that. That's that root of, let me do it my way. And then there's that root of, I know best God. But those roots got to come out. Because God wants to plant beauty in our lives. The enemy wants you to focus on being held down by those bad roots. But God wants you to take them up. God wants, as the Scripture says, to do a new thing His way, according to His purposes. And in His time, they were fearful and amazed because why? He was taking up some roots in their life. And they were asking one another, who then is this? He commands even the winds and the waves, and they obey Him. They were learning a lesson that day on the very waters that they thought they owned as fishermen. He's already taught them how to catch fish, and they were fishermen. And now He's taught these experienced fishermen that not only is He Lord of the nets, not only is He Lord of the waves, He's Lord of their lives. And my friends, I pray the same for you today, that you would know Jesus Christ as your Savior. In just a moment, we'll conclude our service by partaking of communion. You want to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You want to have that assurance that when this life ends, you'll be in eternal life because of what Christ has done for you on the cross. Communion is an outward symbol of that. By taking communion, you're proclaiming the death and the victory of the resurrection. You're essentially saying my assurance is not in myself, not in my circumstances, but it is in Jesus Christ alone. That is where my circumstances are. And so I close with this scripture, 1 John chapter 3, verses 21 to 23. But dearly loved friends, if our consciences are clear, and only Christ could give that, we could come to the Lord with perfect assurance and trust and get whatever we ask, obviously according to His will, for because we are obeying Him and doing things that please Him. In verse 23, and this is what God says we must do. Let's finish it with me together, friends. Believe on the name of His Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another. If you believe that, say amen. amen. Bow with me for a word of prayer before we partake of communion right now. If there are any roots you got to get rid of and give over to the Lord, Prayer is your chainsaw right now. You just bring it before the Lord. It could be roots of regret. It can be roots of self-reliance. It could be roots of secret sin. Whatever it is, God knows exactly where those roots are. And by His grace, you could sever them and remove them so that you could flourish in this next season of your life in Christ. And so before we partake of communion, I think it would be appropriate if we just stay quiet in prayer with all of our heads bowed and eyes closed.
our Father, our God. We thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ, who gives us perfect peace and assurance in the storms of this life, even one day in the storm of death, that you have promised that we will cross over from this life into the next. And we take you at your word. We trust, O oh God, that even in our difficulties, our struggles, our storms right now, that you have promised that we will cross over. That you work all things together for the good of those who love you, O oh God. We're called according to your purpose. You have promised, O oh God, that you will make our path straight if we trust in you. And so we come to this table in full assurance of your promises, including the greatest promise of all, salvation. And as we partake of these elements, we confess our hearts before you. We confess these roots that we have allowed to choke the life that you have wanted to plant in our lives for so long. We confess them and ask you to sever them and remove them. We thank you, O oh God, for your grace. And we now come humbly to receive these elements. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.